you ever wonder why your child likes what he likes to eat? Why one child enjoys salsa and another is absolutely not interested in tasting it? What makes up our flavor preferences? Is it nature or nurture? We're getting to the bottom of this today with my guest, Dr. Julie Manella, a researcher in understanding individual variation in taste and flavor perception. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hello, everyone. Jill here. Welcome to another episode of The Nourished Child. Did you get a chance to listen to my last episode? I talked about my career and motherhood journey, why I switched from pre-med to nutrition in college, how I worked 80-hour weeks to gain nutrition experience and pay the rent, the most influential experience in my career journey to date, and last, how the last 12 years have changed me and my business. It was an episode that evolved out of a point in time when everything in my personal and professional life was literally upside down, and I didn't have an episode in the bank. So I decided to talk about me. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, head on over to episode number 134, and you'll get your ears filled. As we move into spring, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to take a summer break from recording podcast shows. I did this last year, and it was a needed and fruitful break personally. So starting June 1st, I will move into replay mode, and that will go through the summer. I'll be returning in September with brand new episodes. If you have topics you'd like to hear about, let me know by sending me an email or message me in the Nourish Child Facebook group. I wanted to give you a quick In the news update before I introduce my guest, a California report reviewed human and rat studies to gain consensus about neurotoxicity of artificial food dyes. They looked at seven of the nine approved food colors in the United States by the FDA. They state in the report, quote, the body of evidence from human studies indicates that synthetic food dyes are associated with adverse neurobehavioral outcomes in children, and that children vary in their sensitivity to synthetic food dyes. And they also say, quote, overall, our review of human studies suggests that synthetic food dyes are associated with adverse neurobehavioral effects such as inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and restlessness in sensitive children. They do go on to clarify that sensitive children may have ADHD or they may not have ADHD. Personally, I've always felt it's good practice to weed out artificial flavors and colors because some of the studies in the U.S. don't test the realistic amounts that we actually see in our food supply. In other words, they might be underrepresenting what's actually in the foods kids eat and the amounts that they are getting from those foods. I think we need to get our act together on acceptable amounts of food colors in the foods our kids are eating. I will be writing more about this on thenourishchild.com and also creating a YouTube video about it, so stay tuned. It's my pleasure to introduce my guest today, Dr. Julie Manella. Dr. Manella is a member of the Monell Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Monell is a nonprofit independent scientific institute that conducts and publishes interdisciplinary basic research on the senses of taste and smell and how these primal senses affect your health. Dr. Manella got her PhD at the University of Chicago and has made significant discoveries on the development of flavor senses and early nutritional programming. Her research focuses on understanding individual variation in taste and flavor perception and how to measure it, paving the way to tailor medicines and dietary interventions to maximize clinical outcomes in pediatric populations. Her research areas include how volatiles from the maternal diet transmit to and flavor amniotic fluid and breast milk, impacting children's preferences and how childhood is a time of heightened preference for sweet and salty and aversion to some bitter tastes. This work has guided such preeminent initiatives 
as the Birth to 24 Months Project and the World Health Organization's Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. She has also published extensively on the effects of alcohol and tobacco on women's health and infant development. Dr. Manella was the 2020 recipient of the Max Moselle Award, an award given annually by the Association for Chemo Reception Sciences for Outstanding Achievement in the Chemical Senses. So I am super pleased to have Dr. Julie Manella with us today. Let's dive in to this episode. Welcome, Dr. Manella, to the Nurse Child Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm super excited you're here because I've been a huge fan for a long time and have looked at your research over the years. And so it's a real treasure to have you on the show and sharing your knowledge with parents and professionals who listen. And I just read your formal bio, but I always think it's interesting when someone talks about themselves a little bit and shares with us your journey and your career and just, you know, some personal stuff. My graduate work, I was always interested in why do we like what we like. My formal background was more in biology, but when I got a master's and a bachelor's degree in biology, and I was always interested in behavior. So when I sought out a PhD program, I sought, when I went to the University of Chicago where we studied the biological basis of behavior. And there, I think what has always intrigued me is to try to determine why we behave the way that we do or why we like the things that we do. And my approach has always been to start from the beginning. And so that's why I've always had a strong uh, focus on the mother and the infant and early development. I was going to just ask you then, you know, how do flavor preferences begin? So there's a biology that underlies taste. We taste and smell with our brain. We have the machinery begins and the process begins in the periphery. We inhale through our nose. We have liquids or foods in our mouth that will, these chemicals in the foods will activate the taste buds and send messages to the brain. And I think when we're trying to understand how the beginnings of taste and how we form taste preferences or food preferences, There's one thing that I think we really have to establish is that we taste with all of these senses and what our language is limited. We often say foods taste a certain way, but it's really the combination of taste and smell and also the activation of free nerve endings, you know, the hotness of chili pepper. And you can just do a simple test is the next time that you eat, plug your nose and you'll realize that a lot of how you identify a food is really from odors. You know how foods don't taste the same when you have a cold. It's nothing has happened to your taste receptors on your tongue, but the olfactory receptors are blocked. So they can't send those messages and then they'll recover. So when we talk about the taste of foods or how do we begin to like the flavor of foods, it's really looking at all these senses. And it's a really interesting story. And I think it kind of provide some insights in why parents have difficulty in trying to keep kids away from really sweet or salty foods. And I can tell you some of that story now if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. You know, we have basic taste. And so sweet and salty probably define childhood, if you like. Children tend to like things that are sweeter and saltier. But when we look at the development of these senses, one, we see that For many of the senses, for taste, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, for four of those tastes, the baby's born being able to detect them. They can't detect salt until they're a couple months of age. And so this machinery is pretty well equipped. And when we look at sweet taste in particular, and that's a taste that I'm particularly interested in, you can see that the baby really is a sweet connoisseur. Even if you do some research on premature infants, the ability to detect sweet taste and to behaviorally respond to it is evident even before birth. Babies will, Hmm. within hours after birth, they'll drink more of a sweet solution. They'll make a happy, relaxed face when it's in their mouth. They do a whole host of different types of behaviors, all communicating that they like this taste. That's present at birth. And then when you can do different types of tests and you actually try to get into the 
taste world of the child, especially the sweet taste world of the child, you find out that they prefer much higher levels of sweet taste than the adult does. You start to see mm-hmm. the adult pattern in late teenage years. So even your young teenager is living in a different sweet taste world than you are. Uh, they're preferring much higher levels of sweet, and sweet also makes them feel good. It can blunt expressions of pain, hence why the doctor probably gave the lollipop <laughs> around the time the baby got the shot, or the child got the <laughs> shot. It, it uh, blunted pain. They, they really should have given the lollipop before the shot, not after. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Wow. So you're saying that young children experience or prefer even sweeter foods than adults do, which is a really important thing for parents to understand because it explains why they seem to be so drawn to sweets. Yeah, they don't need to experience it to learn to like it. When you think about what the function of taste was as we evolved, it really is an important sense in that it's determining whether we eat something and swallow it and accept it into our digestive system or we reject it. I mean, food is a basic biological commodity we need to eat. And so when you think of the child and you think of sweet taste, first, it is the predominant taste quality of human milk. And we evolved in which babies fed human milk. And so you see that that strong attraction is present even before birth. The other thing is a sweet taste is a signal for calories, carbohydrates, taste sweet. We're bitter, maybe a taste signal for poisons or to be wary of things that taste bitter because they could do harm. And so it really is a beautiful biology combined with salt, which is a needed mineral, is that during childhood, during this period of maximal growth, we're never going to grow as much as we do during childhood, is that you see the baby being attracted to sources of energy in which it needs to grow. Now, we didn't evolve in an environment that had processed sweets, that had added sugar, sugar sugar-sweetened beverages. The taste signal that the child has this biology to be attracted to is fruit and sources of calories. And so it's a very elegant biology, but that biology is now living in an environment in which these foods that are quote unquote, empty calories are inexpensive, they're plentiful, but the child's really designed to like sweets. And so that's part of the Mm. challenge is that they have this biology to attract them to it, but we have to gear it towards the healthy foods that taste sweet. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that umami and bitter were flavors that aren't necessarily liked, you know, from a biological basis. So presumably we have to teach children to like those flavors. No, umami is the quality of human milk and the baby shows the same facial response to sweet taste as it does to umami. Bitter is different. They tend to Mm -hmm. make the faces of rejection, the grimace, but you can learn to like bitter foods. And so that really is what childhood is. You've got this biology and you've got a brain that learns through experience and this learning starts early about food is that you get the experiences to learn to like foods. And if it provides calories, if you don't get sick after you eat the food, if the food is eaten in a positive context with family, that's how we all learn, which is probably a behavior that really defines humans is that We have these food cultural practices that really define who we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for parents out there who might be listening and they think, you know, geez, I've got a picky eater. I can't get them to eat vegetables. All they want to eat are sweets. You know, I'm thinking about like a genetic component. Are are there Mm -hmm. genes passed down that signal children to have a stronger preference or a stronger repulsion to certain flavors that you know of? What we see during childhood, if we look at some of the sweet receptors, is that really all children are higher, uh, regardless of some of these genotypes that we've studied. And so you see the importance of probably this biology in attracting children to energy during growth. 
But children learn. Our childhood is a time where you learn what to eat, how to eat, when to eat, what a food should taste like. And so that's what you learn to like what you eat, basically. And so it's interesting that the new dietary guidelines are recommending that children don't be fed foods that have added sugars until the age of two. I think that this early time may be a time of vulnerability in which you know, children will learn and they'll taste and not everyone is going to like every food, but it's a time with repeated exposure, children can learn to like healthy foods such as vegetables. I think what's most varied among individuals is not sweet taste, it's bitter taste, especially some bitters, where someone can be very sensitive to that bitter taste and another person can't detect it at all. And so I think when mm-hmm. you come to look at the variation in children's response to vegetables. First, one of it is have they have early experience with it. One of the best predictors of acceptance of fruit and vegetables is that they're eating this from an early age. And the other thing with vegetables is probably the variation in genetics. You're never going to necessarily learn to like every vegetable. And actually cuisine, the one of the major role of cuisine, the addition of a little salt or sugar can go a long way in masking or blocking the bitter taste in children. And so Mm -hmm. a little salt can really attenuate that bitterness for some. Yeah. Yeah. I know when my kids were little, I used to add a little butter and a little salt to their (laughs) vegetables. Yeah, it it works. And I, you know, and I think that question really kind of hinges on an important thing is that we don't feed children separately than ourselves. And so Mm -hmm. feeding is more And food is more than a source of calories. It really kind of defines a family, if you will. And so the idea of feeding children something separate than adults is really kind of new. Before Mm -hmm. you can look at many cultures around the world, the first foods would be, you know, the liquid from the family pot. And then you'd actually mash, let's say, the vegetables and gradually increase texture that in a lot of the cross-cultural studies by the age of two, children are eating what the adults of that culture are. So I think mothers feed children what they like. And the baby is learning about what mom is eating because the flavors of the food she eats actually flavor the first foods that we ever experience. And that's amniotic fluid. And if we breastfeed, human milk. And so it is not just to feed a child the foods that you think are good for them, feed the healthy foods that you and your family enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So babies getting those mother diet flavors through the amniotic fluid and breast milk. What about the baby who might be formula fed? Great question. And what research in humans has shown as well as with other animals is that the memory from what a mom made during pregnancy is still there. And so actually... Hmm you can look at the child's first acceptance of a food. And if you do these type of randomized controlled trials and make the mother feed the food during pregnancy and avoid that food during lactation, you actually can see that the preference is still there. There's a lot of redundancy. Really, the baby is getting a lot of information from the mother about what are the foods out in the environment, what are the foods mom likes, what's the foods the family are eating, because those most likely are going to be the first foods that the child eats when they're eating the Mm -hmm. foods at the table. And so I think that we tend to focus on what's important for children, but what's also important for pregnant moms or new mothers and Mm -hmm. try to, you know, I think encourage eating these healthy foods that you enjoy. Sometimes during pregnancy, women like to eat more fruit, keep that up and, Mm -hmm. you know, focus on moms as well, because moms are the, and dads are the vehicle for exposing children to the foods. And so I think we want to focus on their health and their diets as much Mm -hmm. as the baby. Yeah. And that's also so encouraging because it's encouraging to know that baby still remembers what they experienced in utero, even if they're formula fed, because formula has a pretty flat flavor profile, flat in that it does not change day to day. And what's also encouraging is that whether you formula fed your baby or breastfed your baby or did both, 
Once you start introducing foods to the baby, eight to 10 days of just tasting the food, you know, it's called repeated exposure. Just give the baby a taste and over time, they'll learn to like it. You know, you'll see mm-hmm. the facial responses, but don't focus on the face. Focus on whether they open their mouths when you offer the next spoonful. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it takes a lot longer with this repeated exposure to teach an older child. It takes less time for the baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, variety also works. If you gave a baby different taste of a fruit for, let's say, eight days, they'll be more accepting of new fruit. The same is with vegetables. And so the window isn't shut. The door's wide open once you start feeding solid foods, however you decided to, whether you you fed human milk or formula. Mm -hmm. The baby is very open to learning about foods. So you mentioned a window. That's the flavor window. And I wanted to ask you about this topic because I'm starting to see and hear talk of flavor training. And I'm assuming you've heard that terminology where small tastes of, I think in France or somewhere in Europe, some of the mothers would put a small amount of pureed vegetable into the infant formula bottle just to expose. It seemed like it was early, like around four months, just to sort of prime the palate for those flavors. And I'm starting to see and hear a little bit of that here in the United States. I find it very interesting and I'm curious about it because it's always been a confusing thing for people when you say the flavor window is between four and 18 months, but we're not supposed to start feeding babies food until six months. Well, I, I think the flavor window is the lifetime. We could always learn to like new foods. It's just a lot easier. We're more plastic when we're young. So what may be called flavor training, which I'm not familiar with, is repeated exposure. And that research actually started here in the U.S. by Liam Birch, in which just Mm -hmm. giving the baby a taste of food for six, eight, ten days, the baby will be more accepting of it. You don't have to add it to their formula. Once the baby starts eating foods, they'll learn. And they are also learning when you're eating these foods when you're pregnant and if you're breastfeeding when you're lactating. So it's just to give the baby experience with the taste. You learn to like what you eat. It's really pretty simple. You offer the food in a positive context. You never force it on the child. And just a little taste, over time, the baby becomes more accepting of it and they Mm -hmm. will eat more of it. So it's not really for nutrition at that point. It's really just for taste. I guess is the clarification. Um, babies will vary. Some will actually eat more than others. You know, just a taste of it will work. And so really mm-hmm. let the baby guide. And in a lot of the experiments that were done, you know, the baby ate till the baby rejected the, the food three consecutive times. You didn't focus on the faces they made. You focused on whether they kept on opening their mouth when you offered them the next spoonful. So I don't think many are recommending to add things to infant formula. I mean, there's there mm-hmm. are risks that are associated with that. But the baby, mm-hmm. once the mother and father decide to, you know, wean them to complementary foods to complement the milk diet, that's early enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This episode is brought to you by The Nourished Child, the ultimate nutrition school for parents who want to raise good eaters. Kids change a lot. Their nutrition needs, eating habits, and food preferences do too. So much so, it can be hard to keep up. The Nourished Child helps parents get crystal clear on raising healthy kids who are good eaters. We've cracked the code on nourishing the whole child, whether you're raising a baby, a teen, or a child with health concerns. You'll find free resources, guides, tutorials, and programs to help you get the inside scoop on food and nutrients, positive food parenting, and building self-motivated, autonomous kids who enjoy all foods. The Nourished Child builds you up with nutrition and feeding know-how so you can confidently raise a healthy, happy child. Visit thenourishedchild.com today. Let's talk about the role of flavor preferences and how preferences for nutritious foods can impact the overall health of children. You've done some research in that area, I believe. 
One thing we can do to improve health is to eat a healthy diet. I mean, that goes a long mm-hmm. way. I'm not necessarily sure uh, what research you're referring to. Is it more related to weight status in children? How the interaction of flavor preferences connect with risk of overweight or obesity? The one thing that I, now that you mentioned that about weight status, that I think it's really important to know is that, you know, often when you look at sweet preferences, you may think that the child who's overweight has a higher sweet preference. There's no difference. What may be different is that why the child is eating sweet. It may affect their moods in different ways. And so I always think that that's really interesting that foods also then come to be associated with providing comfort. One like the adult, eating something sweet actually can reduce pain in the child. If you see it's a standard of care for some procedures for babies in which they'll give the taste of sucrose because it actually does blunt pain. Because when we Mm -hmm. taste something sweet, we're engaging the parts of the brain that are associated with reward. And so you've got this big release of dopamine that's playing a big role here. So if we sort of summarize a lot of what you know about, and you've said a lot of this throughout this interview, but just for parents who are listening, who are looking for a checklist or five tips to sort of improve or influence the food preferences of their young children for nutritious foods like vegetables, what would you say sort of the top line recommendations would be? There'd be a couple. One would be to eat the healthy foods you enjoy when you're pregnant and then after the baby's born. If you start craving healthier foods like fruit, try to keep it up during pregnancy, try to keep it up later because these foods are not only good for your baby and your child, but they're good for you too. The second thing is to understand sweet taste and sugar and what's a good sugar and what's not. You know, when we think of the good nutrient-rich foods that have sugar, we think of fruit, uh, which are important sources of also protective nutrients. And so what I would say to do for the child is also to do for yourself. Limit added sugar intake, sugar-sweetened beverages, foods like that. And actually, the new recommendations are don't introduce that to your baby's diet until they're two. Uh, And maybe the children are especially vulnerable during the first few years of life when exposed to added sugars. So that would be another thing I would do. Give them repeated exposure to healthy foods once they start eating foods so that they have the opportunities to learn to like them. Focus not on the faces they make, but focus on whether they will accept the next spoonful so that they're able to taste the food. I think whatever I would say for the child, I'd also say for the mom. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. And, if, <laughs> and if, dad. And dad. That's right. Yeah, and I dad mean, it's, too. it's really um, tough. You know, what is added sugar? You know, now hopefully the food labels are going to help us with that. But typically, you know what it is. It's candy. It's, it's sugars that are added during the processing of foods, sugar sweetened beverages, really try to sugar sweetened juices, really try to reduce that even for yourself. Mm -hmm. I have a heart for parents because it's getting harder and harder to navigate, you know, food environment and just the manufacturing of food. And, you know, we're now seeing stuff come out on food coloring and food dyes, and it's getting hard for parents to really sort of strike that balance. We're always saying, you know, a balance of nutritious foods, and it's just getting harder and harder and layer on a picky or a choosy fussy eater on top of that. And it's hard for them. It's really hard for them to feel like they're getting traction and helping their kids. I agree. And I think especially the what's in a food, how to read a label, what the names on the label are, often could have many words that are used just to try to describe a source of sweeteners in a food. But you know the foods that people are recommending, whole grains and fresh fruit and vegetables. But, you know, these tend to be more expensive. So we've got to also acknowledge that as well. 
Yeah. It's a complicated food world we have. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, and I think for the parents of a new baby, it's wide open. And, you know, the baby is open to learning as well. And so don't focus on necessarily what a baby should eat. Focus on what all of you should eat to improve health, to feel better in the long run, to be at your best, because that really is the goal of all of this. It's really the the unit is the family. That's the context in which Mm -hmm. the child grows and learns. And you model the behaviors, the feeding behaviors for the child, siblings, peers, but especially mom and dad. What you eat is playing as big a role as the foods that you give them a taste of so that they learn. Mm -hmm. I find the area of flavor preferences and taste very, very interesting. What is sort of on the horizon for research in this area? Well, some of the things we're really interested in is when you look at the young child and they have a diet that has foods in it that maybe you want to get rid of that are very much preferred, like things that are high in sugar, can you actually train or adapt the child to actually start preferring foods that have lower sugar? You know, kind of looking at this repeated exposure, but really focusing on both sweet and salty. I really think that they go hand in hand. I don't think you can eliminate one without the other in trying to make a change, whether it be in the adult or the child. We know from studies that look at what children are eating, what they're young, and then what they eat as they grow up, which are can't tell you what causes the later diet, but they're interesting. And so we know that what happens during these first two years of life seems to be putting the child on a path for healthy eating. Now, some of the other things that we find is that childhood is a time of heightened sensitivity for some children. And so they may not like all foods. And It may be that it doesn't change until they grow older, like during teenagers when bitter sensitivity actually starts decreasing. So I think just trying to uncover some of these mysteries and what is important for children learning, how can you, you know, help parents and help everyone try to get on a healthy start. Mm -hmm. But clearly those early, early years and exposure to a wide variety of different foods and trying to stay away from sweet added sugar types of foods is really sort of the way to go. I think you're always going to have an easier time getting children to eat fresh fruit than vegetables. It's not to say you shouldn't focus on vegetables, but fruit are important sources of nutrients, micronutrients. That may be easier. So I think you can do both, but that might be an easier task. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, this has been so informative. Is there anything you want parents or even professionals out there, anything additional that you'd like people to know? I'm just in awe. (laughs) I'm really in awe of the mother and the baby. And I think I never uh, will tire of learning about this really unique relationship and all the types of information she's transferring, whether she realizes or not, to prepare the baby for the next step in life. It's really an elegant system that, as I said, I'm, I'm in awe of. Well, I am too. So, and I'm in awe of you and all your research. And oh. I really appreciate you coming on the show to uh, share your expertise with us. Where can people get in touch with you if they have other questions or want to learn more about your My work? Email at Monel is it will be fine. Awesome. And I, I would also say I'm in awe of you because I I think. It's one thing to do the science, but to be able to communicate it or to talk about it to health professionals and parents is important. And we don't always have those forums. We publish in scientific journals. So the opportunity to do this, I thank you. Oh, well, you gave me some things to think about. And I also think it's just, you know, I couldn't do what I do without researchers like you who are really giving us the hard science to turn that into some practical guidelines for parents. But yeah, I think working together hand in hand is really sort of the magic that can happen. I think what we eat or what children eat really is the most important influence on health in modern societies. It's important for long-term health. I agree. 100%. Good. Thank you, Dr. (laughs) Manella, for your time. Thank you. I wish everyone the best. Stay safe. Thanks again. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Nourished Child. Now here's what I want you to do next. If you haven't grabbed my free checklist, How to Nourish a Child, head over to www.thenourishedchild.com and click on the show notes for this episode. This checklist is designed to give you a clear path and the steps you need to take to raise a nourished child inside and out. Also, if you love the show, I'd love for you to rate and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Not only will this give the nourished child a boost, it will also help other parents find it. Now, let's wrap this up. I'm Jill Castle, and until next time, give that child in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.